Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Otto. I am an alcoholic. And I'm also from On and On. So I've got a little clock here that hopefully is going to help me quit before you do. <laughs> best plans still don't work. My best thinking sucks. My life is so unmanageable. See there, I can't even get that to stay up there. I'm off to a good start. I like to drink. I find these novel. <laughs> if you drink the way I drank, you don't need one of those. Ah. But I am pleased to be here in uh, since we're from Washington. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, lots of S's, lots of M's, whatever <laughs> this is. <laughs> we're near Seattle. <laughs> uh, I'm always pleased to be uh, asked to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with. Uh, a bunch of alcoholics. But one thing today, it has a happy ending. You know, it's a story with a happy ending. And for a long time, my life was just this sad, pathetic, oh, can we endure this life? And today, things are better. You know, and I'm really glad to be here. Now, if I'd have known I was going to have a hall like this and a big stage like this, we would have arranged for a choir. <laughs> this This would have been quite a show, let me tell you. And I'd have had some guys over here singing, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. And, I mean, I can put on a show. So. But this is nice, very nice. I'm glad you all are here. I understand this is a new venture, this monthly speaker. And I'm glad that you're here to support it. And I hope that next month you'll bring somebody else with you so that we can start to fill this place up. Uh, Daryl and them are out on a limb uh, financially to make this happen. And uh, we appreciate your support. And those of you that can give more, please do. Because we do this where I'm from. And it's, it's a highlight of the month when the monthly speaker comes in. Not because of the wonderful speakers that come in, but because of the wonderful fellowship we have when we all get together to do this. So I hope that this is a big success, and I'm glad to be a kickoff part of it. You know, Maybe we can put a little bow on this, and, and something will come from it. Uh, I am originally from Oklahoma City. Uh, that's not special other than... The fact that uh, Oklahoma City is not a big city. It's not like Seattle. It's not like Dallas. It's, it's just this little flat place where everybody drives real slow. And all the streets don't have curbs. And you don't get in a hurry. And uh, I used to complain about having to drive all the way across town to do something for my mother-in-law. You know, it was like it would take 12 minutes to get over there. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Oklahoma City was a nice little town, a great place to grow up. Uh, it, it's not a wealthy community. Oklahoma's not a wealthy state. There's a few people that have all the money, the ones with all the land and the oil and whatnot, and the rest of us, we just kind of all huddle in the corner. And I happened to grow up in a little 900-square-foot house that was right outside the second turn of the stock car speedway. And I love race cars. And when I was a little kid, those jalopies would roar around that racetrack and they'd go around that second turn and they'd throw mud over the fence and it would land in my front yard. <laughs> location, location, location. <laughs> this is a prime piece of real estate, okay? But uh, there were six of us living in this little 900 square foot house and the bathroom was about as big as this table right here. And uh, I don't know how we did that, especially since both my parents drank to excess. And it was a very violent and chaotic home. And I had uh, been affected by alcohol long before I ever took my first drink because of the insanity that I grew in. I am a totally delusional person, absolutely out there. It amazes me that you invite me to come and share because, I mean, this is the original Lost in Space kid right here. I know nothing, because everything that I knew when I got here, I was taught by my father. And uh, my father is a police officer. He's my first higher power. 
There's one that has all power. That one is dad. You'd best mind him now. Because if you don't, they'll be held. You know, this is kind of weird being at this low thing here. There's not this big podium here. I keep feeling like, am I zipped? You know, am I... it's, it's like, I'm just kind of up here wanting to cover up, you know. I, I know all you girls want me, you know. It's not like I've got a rag in there or anything, you know. So, shoot. Totally delusional, okay? <laughs> Uh, the way I see the world and the way things are obviously get distant. You know, they're, they're two different things. But I never knew that. I never knew that before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I always thought that if I saw it, that's kind of the way it is. You know, if I feel it, think it, believe it, if I see it, you know, it's kind of like an eyewitness. You got an eyewitness. I'm sorry, I saw it. That's how it is. And I would go to the ball game and they'd call my guy out at first and I saw him safe. And I think that the umpire's on the take. Somebody's paying the umpire off because the guy was safe and he called him out. I saw him safe, didn't everybody? Everybody saw what I saw. I am the standard unit of measure. I am plumb. Any deviation, any variance from the way you see things and the way I see things, that's how far off base you are. (laughs) And I really, I, I believed that. I believed that with all my heart. And uh, that's sad to be an adult, you know, twice divorced. Wonder why. (laughs) When, uh, you know, I have no concept of a perspective or reality that my perspective is a perspective, one of many, until I got here. Uh, So you guys are listening to a real sick person who came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1985, and I've stayed. My sobriety date is July 1985, and I've really liked it because in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned everything I should have learned growing up. This is where I learned all the stuff about how to live life on life's terms, how to be successful, how to be happy, how to get along, how to stay married, how to like your wife after many, 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 many difficult years. (laughs) And... uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable this evening. My, my nephew's here. I have to. I won't make him stand up or anything, Kevin. Uh, you know, and for all these years, I've been able to say I'm the only member of my family that's gotten sober. You know, wham, because I come from a real sick family. I mean, whew. but my my nephew Kevin has what a hundred days? Ninety three. Go, Kevin. Go. And I couldn't be more excited to have a family member in recovery. This is going to be exciting. (laughs) I can't wait to watch this one. It's going to be fun. This is better than sponsorship, just watching my nephew. See, I know the truth. (laughs) And in my family, if you're like my family, my family where I come from, you know, our favorite pastime is talking about whoever's not there. That's what we do. We don't ever, you know, we're never introspective. We never talk. Well, we may talk about ourselves, but we like to talk about whoever's not there. That's why Kevin's here tonight. <laughs> you know, he came all the way up from Sacramento just to make sure he wasn't the topic of my speech. Now. <laughs> Little does he know he's not that important. But... Uh... I'll get going here in a minute. I'm... Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I learned things like, growing up, I learned uh, practice makes perfect. Where there's a will, there's a way. If anyone can, you can. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. Exceptions are made for exceptional people. Always give a man a good hand. Don't be afraid. Don't you cry. I'll give you something to cry about. Don't feel bad. If you feel bad, there's something wrong with you, I thought. And so I was a chameleon, and it didn't matter what I was feeling. I'm fine. I'm fine. How you doing? I'm fine. Now, you know, the night before, I opened up the door, and I see my, uh, my I listened to my mom screaming, and I see my father on the bed in this converted garage, this one-car garage, and 
I'm looking down these wooden stairs, and my dad's got my mom pinned to the bed with his knees on her shoulders, and he's hitting her in the face with his fists, and the blood's all over the bed, and it's all over the walls. And you know, when he tells me to get back to my room, and I go, and the next day I'm off, and everything's fine. And around my house, we don't talk about what happens around my house. Uh, if I want to spend any time with my dad, I, the person I most wanted to please was my father. You know, he was a motorcycle cop. I, oh, I wanted to be a motorcycle cop. I wanted to ride motorcycles. I saw all the cool bikes you got. Who's got the little trike? Whose trike's that? That's your trike? Will you take me for a ride? <laughs> I always wanted to ride a bike. You know, my dad was a motorcycle cop. He was cool. And uh, he used to take me for rides when I was a little kid. But uh, if I wanted to hang out with my dad, I had to go to the tavern. Because that's where he was when he wasn't working. And so I'd go down to the tavern. I grew up in taverns. And I grew up with uh, Honky Tonk and uh, and uh, bookies and uh, shooting shuffleboard and playing dominoes and parlay cards and fighting and greasy hamburgers and belching and dancing and it was fun. <laughs> I had no idea what reality looked like. Uh, I thought we were normal. We'd dress up on Sunday and we'd go to church. We went to one of the finest churches in Oklahoma City, a very modern church, had the first escalator in Oklahoma City. <laughs> we are cool. Ah, big pipe organs. God, it was great. We'd go in there and Sing, Jesus loves the little children. Then we'd go home and get the hell beat out of us. You know, I just, it was confusing for me. Church was confusing. One Sunday we went to church. I loved our minister. His Bill Alexander was the name, Fiery Redhead. I loved listening to him preaching. One Sunday he didn't show up. It turned out he had perished in a plane crash the night before. That was confusing to me. But we don't talk about those things in my house. You don't ask dad questions he doesn't have answers to. If you want to talk to my dad, first off, we had picture in picture before picture in picture was cool. Okay? Because my dad would put one television on top of another television so that he could watch all the sporting events at once. You know, don't even need picture, don't need split vision. We got TV on TV. And when you talk to my dad, you don't talk to him, you talk at him while he's watching TV. And he may respond to you and he may, may not. And uh, so we don't talk to my dad about things like death and about fear and and whatnot. You know, when my dad, uh, uh, you know, he he's, he teaches me things like how to kill, and uh, he uh, put me in jail when I was like ten. Took me down, put me in jail, so I'd know what I was in for if I wasn't a good boy. And uh, uh, he was my hero. He was my idol. I tried my very best to be everything that I thought he wanted me to be. I played football and basketball and baseball. I played all the sports. wasn't good at any of them. Uh, but I played and tried real hard at all of them. And I was in politics. I was student council. And I emceed the pep rallies and headed up the paper drives at a big high school. And, and uh, oh, I was class president, voted friendliest boy at school. I'm top teen. I mean, the teachers give me gifts when I graduate. I am a good kid. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. You know, the, it wasn't, I could not be good enough to keep my mom and dad from going to Catfight City. My mom and dad married and divorced each other three times before I got out of high school. They couldn't live with each other. They couldn't live without each other. And I'm married and divorced and married and divorced. And my sister is married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced. And I have two younger brothers, married and divorced. And married and divorced and married and divorced. We do not have a family tree. <laughs> we have a family thicket. <laughs> because, I mean, every poor little kid in my family has got like 12 sets of grandparents and a half of a quarter of a Cherokee hoochie mama and... <laughs> You know, Christmas is the holiday from hell. Everybody wants a piece of some kid somewhere at some time, and you can, there's no way you can get to everybody. And, you know, my family is the kind of family where we give each other alcohol and drugs for gifts. Okay? 
Now, if you didn't grow up in a family like this, you, you may have raised your kids in one like this, but you didn't. It was, it was, it was bizarre. And no one ever mentioned alcoholism. Nobody ever, it was never a topic. I came into, I went into a treatment center when I was uh, 37 years old. And, and that treatment center was the first time I had ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd never heard of you before. I had no idea what an alcoholic was, except that it certainly couldn't be a stud like me. And it obviously wouldn't be a police officer like my father. So I have no idea what an alcoholic is. I think it's like a Skid Row bum or a W.C. Fields, you know, somebody funny with a red nose or something. I have really no concept whatsoever. All I know is that I am a good person, and I'm trying as hard as I can to do it right, to put on a good show, to make you like me. Thank you. Oh, I'm okay. God, for a minute there, I didn't think I was okay. Yeah, As, uh, I needed you all to tell me I was okay because uh, I knew the truth about me. You know, I knew what I was doing when y'all weren't looking, and I knew the things I was doing that I got caught forward, didn't get in trouble for because my dad was a policeman, and I knew the things that, uh, that, you know, I know all the truths about me, and if you all knew the truths about me, you wouldn't want anything to do with me. You know, and so I needed very much so for you all to tell me I was okay and to approve of me and that I looked nice and and I did stuff a rag down my pocket there many, many a time, trying to impress somebody. And uh, <laughs> married and divorced, married and divorced. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, 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 we were all pretty screwed up uh, before we ever took our first drink, any of us kids. And I, I had mom when I was fifteen, and an older boy bought us some alcohol and. We went out in the field and drank this cold, or actually warm, Coors beer. And uh, didn't have pop tops then. You had to use a church key to open the cans. And uh, I remember just hating the way it tasted. Hot beer. But I didn't have to drink very much of it before. <laughs> I, alcoholics drink for the effect. And I like the effect that alcohol has on me. Because it don't matter what's happening. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> when I have a few drinks. And so it didn't matter what it tastes like. If it could make me feel like that, I'm in. I'm on. Let's go. I want to play. You want to do it? I'll do that. I'm not afraid. I'll take off my pants. I'll do it naked. <laughs> I was a dry pledge in my fraternity at Oklahoma State University. They said, Otto, you embarrass us. You can't drink anymore until you become a member. You ever been indignant? <sighs> what do you mean I can't drink anymore? Yeah. You, know, you got to go some to embarrass the fraternity boys. Yeah. You know? Back in the 60s, streaking was cool, though. And for those of you that don't know what streaking is, that's just running around naked. <laughs> We run all over campus naked. I just loved it. It was so much fun. We, you know, we'd put the top down on the car and stand up in the seat and hang on to the, to the windshields and just let them flop. You know, just let's see how fast we could make it around the sorority row. You know, and uh, God, it was fun. You know, just drinking and partying and playing camp. It didn't go over real big on Mom's Day. That's why I became a dry pledge. You know, I just didn't know where the boundaries were. You know, I just have, I always thought you were having as much fun as I was. Aren't you having as much fun as I am? Golly, I'm having so much fun. And people weren't. And didn't take long. You know, I didn't do very well in school. I'm the, I am the only member of my family of origin, family of six, to finish high school. Neither of my parents, my older sister, or my two younger brothers ever finished high school. And so I was the first to go to college. My dad was real proud, but I didn't do well because I drank to excess. And never had a clue that drinking was a problem. You know, I always thought that uh, I could always justify, rationalize, minimize, explain away why I was drinking the way I was, such that it was never the fact that I drank to excess that was causing me whatever issue I was having, like low grades. Uh, it's really hard to study when you're down at the, you know, Coachmen having draft beers. They have draft beer night. I mean, 
I have to go to draft beer night. I mean, it's bargain night. I mean, we don't have a lot of money. I have to go to bargain night when the opportunity is there, right? So I go down, drink draft beer, and I end up getting drafted. <laughs> That's how it worked for me. And uh, 1967 was a terrible time to get drafted. 1967 was the, you know, the Vietnam War was just really getting going. And 1968 was a miserable time to go to Vietnam. But that's when I went. 68 was just an incredible year. I mean, all kinds of things were happening in 68. You know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Kennedy was assassinated. Vietnam was Tet Offensive. And 68 was just wild. People are raising hell about the war and they're complaining and they're marching around and they're saying, we don't want this war. And Vietnam was the first televised war. You know, those of you that have... Uh, uh, loved ones in the service, and those of you who have served, thank you very much for your sacrifice and for your generosity and what you've done for us. And for those of you that have loved ones over there now, my son-in-law uh, has been over there twice, two tours in Iraq, you know, and I care very much, worry about them. I hate war. I don't like war. I've been in war. And those of you that have served, thank you so much for your service. But uh, this war was televised, and everybody back here in the United States is mad. Because they're showing pictures of what we're doing in war. They're showing pictures of little girls running down the road with everything burned off of them. I mean, not even flesh. I mean, just a little girl running down the road. You know, and they're showing babies in ditches, you know, that have been shot up and bludgeoned and burned. And they show guys getting shot in the head and executed in the streets. And they're showing what war is really like. They showed what war was really like in the 60s. And America was angry. America said, this is not right. We don't want our boys over there doing that. And I was all for it. Let's not send our boys over there to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, I did everything I could do to avoid going to Vietnam. Uh, I, did, I had no desire to go to Vietnam whatsoever. I am not, uh, I mean, you know, I'm class president, top team student council, friendliest boy. I am not an executioner. You know, I am just not a let me go murder you, climb around in the leeches in, in the dark. And uh, But that's what we did. And uh, we did horrible things, saw horrible things. And uh, it was a, a traumatic experience. Combat in the war for me was a very traumatic experience. Uh, I was blessed in that it didn't take me long to get hurt. Uh, in 1968, uh, the, it, the combat was so intense that uh, I, no, I saw no one come home. You know, and back then we did a year. If you could do a year, you got to come home, and you only had to do it once. You could volunteer to go again, but you only had to do it once. It didn't go two, three times like they do now. It's a whole other subject. But if you could just survive for that one year, then you could come home. But I saw no one come home because nobody could last a year in this intense combat. And that didn't take me long to, to mess up. Uh, we went in on a hot LZ hot landing zone. We knew the enemy was there. So we went in uh, in the mountains up in the highlands and it was just a little hole that had been blown in the jungle. It really wasn't a clearing. And we went in with just weapons and water because we knew we were going to have a fight with the NVA. These are regular army guys. They have uniforms and they have artillery and all kinds of support. These are not little little guys that are just running around in pajamas. These are real army guys. And uh, we went in there in, uh, in an air assault and uh, they kicked our butts. And we've got helicopters down on the ground and they're burning and the LZ's blocked. There's just a few of us in on the ground, about 30 of us that got in on this big assault. And uh, we're in big trouble and the CO radio's down. He says, we're going to drop firefighting equipment into you, Otto. We're going to drop some plastic explosives into you. We need for you to get some of these trees knocked down, enlarge the landing zone. Let's get some of these fires out so we can get some help into you. You need help. I know. We need help. And so I'm watching him as he comes hovering over these burning hell these other aircraft that are down burning and he's hovering to drop this stuff to us and here comes a rocket and takes his bird and he falls down into the fire with the others and his helicopter's on fire. You know, me and a kid named Henderson run out there and we're getting these guys out of this burning helicopter and one of the guys was blown out of the door, the treetop height. He's blown out of the door. He just fell into the jungle. I saw his torso just go falling into the jungle. And me and Henderson went into that jungle looking for him. Now, I'm no hero. I'm decorated for heroism for this, but I am no hero. I just didn't see anybody else. And it's very important. You know, I was not fighting for America, I promise you. Well, at this point in time over in Vietnam, I was fighting for my buddy. I'm fighting for the guy that's next to me so that I'm not by myself. And when Henderson went around the corner, I'm going with him. Okay, so we, we go find this kid, and he's blown to pieces. 
He is blown to pieces, but he's still alive. But this haunted me. This was a great excuse to drink. There's only one reason why I drink the way I drink, and that's because I'm an alcoholic. I drink because I'm an alcoholic. For no other reason would a person drink the way I drink than an alcoholic. If if I were to list all my drinking experiences on there, a, a reasonable person would look at that and go, this person's an alcoholic. He should have quit way back here. And yeah, look, <laughs> you know, he, yeah, he don't drink right. You know, this is, you know, that's just an excuse because everybody that got blown up in Vietnam does not drink to excess. But that was a great excuse for me to drink and use the way I did. Uh, and this, the nightmares I had about this young man, because we got to him, he had no legs, his arms were all mangled, and his face is destroyed. And he's still alive, and he's crying, and he's calling for his mom. We used our bootlaces to put tourniquets on high on his thighs, trying to stop the bleeding, and we put pressure all over him, trying to stop the bleeding, and trying to muffle his cries so he won't draw fire, and uh, trying not to suffocate him, and the, the uh, medic finally comes and takes over, and I go back into the fight, and I never never knew who this kid was. He was just one of the door gunners in a helicopter. I'm a ground pounder. and uh, But I had nightmares about him all the time. You know, I have nightmares. I have lots of nightmares. I have nightmares of, of Vietnam. I, I have nightmares of uh, my dad beating my mother. I have nightmares of my brother hanging himself in a prison cell. You know, my little brother went to prison... And he used a T-shirt. Uh, you know, this is the unmanageability in our life. You know, my brother's a glue sniffer and a paint sniffer, and and he he's beating my mom up. You know, when my dad finally left for the last time, my little brother would come in and he'd batter my mother, and he'd take her TV or stereo or purse or whatever he needed to get his drugs and alcohol. And so one night she calls me and I go down there. She's all tore up. The house is all tore up. Bible's all tore up. Everything's tore up. And I call the police. They, you're, you served a warrant on him for using stolen credit cards. And I went before the judge. I said, Your Honor, please incarcerate my brother. Please. He's a glue sniffer and a paint sniffer. And he batters my mother. He almost killed my uncle. He used his one call to tell me he's going to kill my baby daughter. He needs help. Help my brother. Don't let him go. Don't give him probation again. Help my brother. Two-year state penitentiary. I thought, Whoosh. now we get a get a break, you know. I don't have to sleep with that pistol anymore. That's not what happened. They put him to work painting. <laughs> Give me a break, come on. <laughs> you know, he's a glue sniffer and a paint sniffer, and they're going to put him to work painting. <laughs> this is not the plan. He gets high, oh, my, and uh, they, they find him, you know, and they put him in a holding cell to transfer him back to a, a more secure place, and he hanged himself. He killed him. So he got to that stepping off point. And uh, I didn't know it then. That the, then it was just my fault. And my family was happy to blame it on me because it was my idea to go before the judge and ask for them to incarcerate him. And I have felt like a failure my whole life. You know, the next day in that fight in Vietnam, I walked up on an enemy position and I was shot twice. Just a short burst of machine gun fire. Ring! And two rounds went through me. One went right through my uh, left cheek came in right here and came out next to my sphincter. You ever heard the expression, we're going to blow your ass off? <laughs> I carry my billfold over here so it looks, so it looks like there's something going on because see, there's nothing going on over there. <laughs> Ain't nothing over there. They took it with them. And uh, the other round went right through my ankle, my left ankle. And uh, when I turned uh, 21, I'd been in the hospital four months. Spent seven weeks in a hospital in Japan and then went to a hospital in California and then a hospital in Texas. I finally wound up at Reynolds Army Hospital in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, so I could be close to my family <laughs> and get that, get that family support, you know, to help you to heal. <laughs> and uh, when I turned 22, I was still there. I spent the first nine months in a body cast called a spica, plaster, from here down. Can't move anything but my arms for nine months. I have a gross staph infection that will not let me heal. Everything's blown off, and they're trying to stick it back together with just big screws going every which way. They've got my left leg shortened up about four inches, and they've got my foot fused in a dropped position so I can walk on my toe, hopefully turned out. And, but it will not fuse because of this infection, and they just keep cutting pieces of me off. They just keep cutting pieces off. And I swear I've been tortured. I've been tortured. I was in the hospital 21 months. 
And when I finally got out of the hospital, I had an open draining wound in my buttocks for seven years. I wore big gauze bandages on my butt, or my butt should be, to keep this pus from running out on my clothes. And guess what? I feel sorry for me. All my buddies have gone on and got their degrees and they're in dental school and they're they're doing good and they've got careers and jobs and I'm on crutches and I can't walk and I can't sit down. They're trying to get this thing to fuse solid. I, I can't sit on a chair. I can't ride a bicycle. I can't ride in the backseat of a car. I can't sit on a toilet. Uh, uh, I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm really angry. I remember one time I went to a therapist. I, went, I saw a lot of therapists. <laughs> I saw a lot of therapists, a lot of doctors. I'm a dock worker. It has nothing to do with boats, okay? I know you guys had big ships out here, but no, I'm a dock worker. Never been on the docks. I have been to a lot of docks, though, to get medication because I like to eat pills. And, you know, it hurts. It hurts. You know, if you had this if you had this wound, if you had this injury, well, you'd, you'd take medication too. This is not something I'm making up. You know, this is not a back hurt, oh, you know, even though I know those are real. But, I mean, I got a bad wound. I could go to any doctor, anywhere. I'd just drive out of town a few miles, you know, and just go into some little clinic and drop my pants, and they'd go, oh, shit, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> How did you? Oh. How long are you going to be away from home? Yeah, let me give you some whole bunch of this, yeah. <laughs> and then the VA would send me more in the mail. You know, I got pills coming out my wazoo, and I like to carry them in this little watch pocket right here in my 501 blue jeans. <laughs> All through the day, you know. What you got? Tic Tac. <laughs> Can I have one? Oh, all gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I'd eat those pills and I would drink. Mm. And I thought I deserved every drink I took. And when people would say, Otto, you drink too much. Otto, you take too much medication. Otto, you need to save a little money. Otto, you need to get to bed a little earlier. Otto, you need to get up and go to work. My answer for all of them was, you don't understand. You don't understand. I cannot imagine my life without alcohol and drugs. Now, I hadn't gotten to the point where I can't imagine it with or without. But I never, I am one who has never tried to quit. To quit drinking would be stupid. <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> I like to drink. I drink a lot. Drinking's fun. I had no idea that drinking was part of my problem. It was totally my solution because when I don't drink, my life is fingernails on a chalkboard. How you doing, Otto? Yeah, okay. Yeah, whoa. Yeah, my brother ate himself. Yeah. My brother's going to jail too. I tried to keep him out, but oh, no, no. Oh, God. Yeah, my mom's dating the milkman. Give me a drink. People would buy me drinks. God, Otto, please. <laughs> Somebody move that chalkboard, please. Mm. It was sad. But I was a fun guy. I thought I was fun. You know, I like to dance. I might be crippled. <laughs> and you can't tell because I am just a challenged person. <laughs> and I can do anything you can do. I will whip your butt, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I ain't scared of nothing. My daddy told me not to be. That's why I have big guns and big dogs and double bolts on my doors, but I ain't afraid of nothing. <laughs> and I had no clue what was wrong with me. All I knew was if I could just get to the right woman, you know, if I could just get to the right place with the right stuff and the right funding, I'm terribly underfunded, if I could just... <laughs> If I could just get where I was supposed to be, you know, because I am a good person and I am trying hard, then I know things will work out, but they just never work out. I cannot catch a break. You know, things just do not work. And, you know, for me, practice does not make perfect. And for me, where there's a will, there's more often a conflict than there is a way. And uh, But those are the tools I had to work with. Uh, towards the end of my drinking... Uh, I'm, uh, I've gone from being a, 
a fun guy who likes to drink, to drinking alone. You know, I'm unemployed and unemployable. I drink at home. I eat pills all day. I stay up till 2, 3, 4 o'clock at night because I'm afraid to go to bed because I'm afraid of the thoughts that I have and I'm afraid of the dreams that I have. And so I drink till I pass out, and then I get up the next day at noon, 1, 2 o'clock, and I don't want people to know I'm still in bed at noon, 1, 2 o'clock, so I've got the blinds pulled and I don't answer the phone. Oh, they turned the phone off because I haven't paid the bills. I haven't been to work in a few days. Well, things aren't working for me. And uh, but that didn't matter because whenever I went out, I was looking good. I was a chameleon. You know, how did I get to be top teen and friendliest boy and all that stuff while I'm growing up in this insane home? My little brother had colitis when he was 10. That's ulcers of the intestines. It was so chaotic and stressful in our home that he had to have most of his intestines and his rectum removed when he was 10. He crapped out of a little bag on his side called a colostomy, and he had to follow Superboy into high school with that sickness. You know, and I had no idea what caused that, that that was a, that was a byproduct of alcoholism. I had no idea that the stress and the chaos in our family was killing us all. Uh, so anyway, I'm... Uh, Unemployed, unemployable, I'm divorced again, I'm not dating, I'm not date worthy. <laughs> uh, I don't own a home, I don't have a pet, I live on a little mattress on the floor, I can't go broke because the VA sends me a little pension in the mail every month. But I do have a very nice car, and some cool fake jewelry, <laughs> and some fake alligator boots, and when I'm out in public, you'd think I was a model for GQ. You think I worked, you know, for somebody. <laughs> but it's not true. Because uh, I drink too much. I went to Florida for the car races. I, like I said, I'm a racing fan. I went down there. This is my, my last hurrah. My last hurrah. And uh, I went to uh, the Daytona 500. And I, was, I had worn all my friends and everybody out. So I, I drove down there by myself and my new leased car that I couldn't afford. And I met up with some good old boys. It's easy to meet up with the good old boys that drink the way I drink. You know, I never hooked up with the family that has the three little kids and the Playmate cooler. <laughs> you know, I hook up with the big old boys, got the big styrofoam cooler, you know, and it's just full of alcohol. And so I meet up with these guys from Lindsay, Oklahoma, and we are having fun. We're going to all the races over Central Florida. There's races everywhere during Daytona Speed Weeks. And we happen to be at the Florida State Fair at Tampa Fairgrounds and watching the late models go in circles. And we were having a ball of drinking and eating those little pills. And uh, we left there, and the fair's going on, and we strolled around the fair, and we threw balls at Cupid dolls and ate corny dogs and and we looked at the girls, a lot of cute girls. I'm a girl watcher. I like to watch the girls. And I appreciated y'all sending Greta to get me. That was fun. like watching that. And that was a big part of me coming back in the beginning. You know, y'all would say, y'all want what we got? Come back. I, I, I'll take some of that. <laughs> okay, I'm, back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Anyway, we're walking around the fairgrounds and we're eating things and watching girls. And then we leave there and we go to a nightclub. And I'm in my environment. I am a nightclub kind of guy. I love to dance. And this place was called the pit because it had a big pit that you go down into to dance. And everybody would stand around up above them, look down into the pit and watch them dance. And I'm dangling that fake jewelry off the edge there, you know, just trolling. Just trolling for some little girl. <laughs> One of you little girls is going to want some of this. Yes, yeah, sir. Anyway, been dancing, Karen. It's like 2 in the morning, and I got sick. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever done this. I staggered out of that club. I am sick. That stuff just come exploding out of my face. I mean, vomit's going everywhere, you know. It's on my boots. It's on my pants. It's on this poor guy's car, you know. I mean, ugh. Oh, God. 
I got little pieces of corn dog stuck up in my nose. <laughs> oh. 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 Holding onto the car so I don't fall down. Go back in the club and get another drink. <laughs> I have to wash that taste out of my mouth. <laughs> Tastes like battery acid. I know it does. <laughs> oh, telling this little gal that I'm making all my moves on the cute little blonde with the big sore on her lip right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I got sick. <laughs> I got sick of you, will not believe this. I promise. Let me promise you this right now. I will never, ever, ever again, as long as I live, ever eat another state fair corn dog. <laughs> that greasy damn thing made me sick. <laughs> you know what? And when I said that, that was not a lie. I was not covering my tracks. Two and two is four, that's up, that's down, and that corn dog made me sick because I drink just fine. Thank you. I enjoy drinking. I can drink a lot. I think I'll have another. Never had a clue. Wound up in a treatment center against my will. Was forced into treatment by the VA of all people. They're supposed to be helping us veterans, and they want me to quit drinking and drugging? Come on, look at the holes. Look at the holes. Give me a break. They had me take a battery of tests, spent all day taking a battery of tests. You know what their conclusion was? Otto, you're angry. <laughs> I could have told him that. You know, just give me a grenade. You know, yeah, we'll just take it, fix this. And, golly. and I thought that maybe I had a problem with Valium, so I was willing to go to this treatment center to get off Valium because when I would run out of Valium, I don't know about any of you all, if you've ever been addicted to Valium or Xanax, but when, when I would run out of that stuff, I mean, my hair would just, this is, I don't have any hair, but he used to stand up, you know, it would just go, wow, it would just, I'd get just miserable, and I'd go back to the doctor and I'd say, oh, no, this is not working, this is not working, I need, you need to put me on something else, you know. He says, well, just take it as prescribed. You're not drinking on that, are you? No, no. <laughs> you know, he says, don't take too much of it. You'll be fine, you know. And I'm, I'm always out. You know, that's how they convinced me I was an addict in treatment. They said, Otto, people that don't have a problem with pills don't run out of pills. <sighs> people that don't have a problem with pills don't count their pills. <sighs> They just kept nailing me. Mm. Okay, 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 okay. I got a problem with Valium. I'll, I'll, I'll cop to that. But the rest of it's legit. You know, I like to drink. And this hurts. Oh, you want to see? I mean, it hurts. And, and, uh, and I need that Demerol and that Darvin said and that Percocet said. And, uh, you know, I, I need that. And uh, he said, no, probably not. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I went to treatment for to get off the Valium and get on something else. And what happened was is I got the detox that I needed. And while I was there, I met you. And you guys were amazing. Absolutely amazing. It was the first time in my life I ever met anybody that I couldn't look them right straight in the eye and say, you don't understand. Because the difference was you all didn't say, Otto, you drink too much. You said, Otto, I drank too much. And this is what happened when I drank. And this is what I thought I was drinking. And this is what I found out why I'm really drinking. And y'all were talking about stuff that was my secrets. You know, y'all come in there and start sharing. And I'd be going, <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there. Family secrets. You know, you guys are talking about feelings and stuff. I have no idea. You know, they gave me this little card with all these little funny faces on it when I was in treatment. You know, this is what angry looks like. This, this is what happy looks like. I knew those two. 
The other 28, I had no clue. <laughs> you know, what is lonely? What is frustrated? What is this? Disappointed? I have no idea how to feel. I haven't felt since I was a kid. Anytime I had a feeling and I had a drink, I do not know how to feel. I am totally disabled emotionally and socially. I'm functionally illiterate. I'm a college graduate, and I could not read in this treatment center. My eyes would move across the page, and I'd be saying the words in my head as they moved, but then there was nothing left when I got to the next line. It was just gone. And uh, you guys came in and talked about stuff like that. I'm just like, wow. And it's that, just like it says in the big book, you know, we identify. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic can, you know, when sufficiently armed with the truth about himself, can help this other person to see the truth about themselves. And that's just exactly what happened to me. You guys came in and told me about you, and I went like, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? <laughs> A stud like me. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, this explains everything. I mean, I had changed wives, uh, hairstyles, uh, hobbies, hangouts, careers, location. I had changed everything, trying to wrestle some kind of happiness out of my life. Never knew what was wrong until you guys told me. Mom, Dad, we're all alcoholics. <laughs> they weren't as excited about it as I was. <laughs> They didn't come to family week. They, 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 they went. But you know, I am an overachiever and a perfectionist. I thought those were attributes when I got here. <laughs> uh, they, I was so low when I got to treatment. Oh God, I loathed myself. I was just down here talking to everybody. So I'm nothing. I mean, can I get a little? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Mm -mm. Is there anything you can say nice about yourself, Otto? Well, I have nice hair. <laughs> That's about as far as I went. Thank you. I was a sick baby. But anyway, I was excited because at least I had, you know, a plan. I had, I had something to do besides give up because I was at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. I am as miserable as I can be. I cannot be more miserable. I cannot drink more alcohol. I cannot eat more pills. I cannot. I cannot be any more isolated or alone. I cannot be any more terrified of the dark or going to sleep. I am, thank you so much for giving me this hope that maybe I'm just this sick alcoholic that can be helped. It's a treatable disease, you said. It's treatable. We have a treatment for this. You know, we treat it with abstinence. <sighs> Ooh, I know what abstinence means. That's what that means because, you know, just because I decide that, you know, okay, I'm alcoholic, that doesn't mean that my mama changed, my daddy changed, my history changed, my hip changed, you know. I didn't see the things I see. I didn't do the things I do. I mean, everything's the same. The only thing that's different is I'm not drinking. So now what? You know, and you guys said, well, we have a program of recovery. Very simple, not easy. Very simple. You want you to uh, become part of our fellowship. You hang out with us here in AA. We get together. We're a social bunch, you know. And if you've got one hand in Johnny's hand, and if you've got one hand in Billy's hand, you don't have a hand to drink with. And if we'll just all stand around and hold hands, you won't get drunk. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. Of course, I don't like holding hands or hugging or any of that stuff. But, you know, you guys had some really wise answers to some really difficult questions. I don't know answers. I don't have many answers for anything. Nothing's working for me. Uh, you said, so you're going to hang out with us. We're going to have fellowship. You're going to go to our meetings, you know, and we're going to talk about the solution. We're not going to talk about the problem. You know, we identify with each other because of the problem, but we have a solution to our problem, our common solution. We're going to share about that in our meetings. So you come do that, and we have 12 steps. And we're going to work these 12 steps. They have this little 
shade on the wall, you know, pull it down, and uh, it had these 12 steps on it, and, and uh, God, 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 God damn, oh no, <laughs> it was a God deal, I couldn't believe it. Oh, no, you guys have reeled me in. Just like it says in the book, first you tell them about the malady. You know, come on in here, I don't, come on. Just set that, baby. Just set that hook. You know, you got me. Okay, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay, God, oh no, that won't work. No, I was angry. No, 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 no. You know, I went to treatment at St. Anthony's Hospital. <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> Here again, I cannot, you know, I'm always growing up. You know, I should have went to Schick. I should have went to the VA. I should have went somewhere where they could help me. I'm furious. <sighs> and this guy named Mike. You know, you don't have to have a lot of sobriety to help people. Show up at these hospitals and places. We help people. You guys know but if you're new, come on. Come on down to the hospital. You can help people like me. If you got a few days, you got more days than the folks at the hospital. And a guy named Mike, he didn't have a lot of sobriety, and he wasn't particularly sharp. <laughs> he certainly wasn't as pretty as I am. <laughs> but he was sober. And uh, he was asking me why I had such a problem with this God deal. And so, man, I let him have it. Both barrels. Well, if there's a God, where's he been? If there's a God, where was he during the Holocaust? Huh? If there's a God, where was he when my daddy's beating my mom? If there's a God, where did my minister die in that plane crash? If there's a God, why'd my brother hang himself in that cell? If there's a God, why'd I get my ass blowed off and lay in that hospital and suffer for two years? Why do I live with daily chronic pain if there's a God that loves me? If there's a God, why were there all those children out at that children's convalescent hospital with my little brother and there's thalidomide babies and cancer babies and burn kids and sick kids and there's young people dying? You know, if there's a God, he's a damn terrorist. Well, I'll fight you about it. I don't want nothing to do with him. He says, well, I'm making a mess here. <laughs> uh... He says, Ollie, he says, you, 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 you quit too soon. He says, you got the guy there in step three, and you left out the as we understood him. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you don't, you know, what would God have to be for you to take a chance and try and turn your will and your life over to his care? I'm going, what? And so I told him the story. This is the story. The day I was shot. <laughs> I don't lose anything here, okay. Uh, and uh, I walked up, I walked right by my guys. The jungle was so thick, I walked right by them. They saw me, I didn't see them. Uh, and I knew I'd gone far enough to get to them, and I stopped and I said, Hubbard, that's my radio operator's name. As soon as I hollered Hubbard, a machine gun right there, rah, cut me in two. And I spun to the ground, and I had just come back from the landing zone getting a fresh ruck because we'd gone in with just weapons and water. And I lay there, and my first thought, I mean, it takes a moment to realize that this has happened to me. I mean, you don't, it's not like you're, somebody said, watch this. Uh, it's happened, and I'm on the ground, and I realize I've been shot. And my second thought was, God help me. And my third conscious thought was, no way. No, no God. There, there can, I, September 22nd, 1968, I stopped wondering and considering if maybe there was a God. I became totally self-propelled, totally self-reliant on September 22nd, 1968. I had seen enough. If there's a God, I, have, I am not putting my bod in his hands because I just tried to put together half of a guy yesterday. And Mike, this not very sober guy, says, well, I don't, you quit too soon. It's God as we understand him. And he gave me a real gift. He says, you do not have to believe in the God you gave up on in Vietnam. Whoa. Think about it.
about that. Those are some powerful words for me, folks. Because with that sentence, he let me out of the corner I had painted myself into since 1968. Where I could no longer look. Where I could no longer seek. Where I had made a decision, you know, and I'm a man of my word. And it let me out of that corner. And he says, what would God have to be? And I thought that was a ridiculous proposal for me to define God. But I came up with a real simple concept. If God's all powerful and with all his power, all he wants is for me to stay sober and like it. There's the hook. I got to like it. If I don't like it, I don't want it. You know, okay, that's it. I'm out. Uh, and, you know, Mike came back a few days later and I told him about my concept and I fully expected him to say, oh, no, you misunderstood. No, I'm sorry. Pick a team. Come on. What are you going to be? Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian. Come on, pick a team. What are you going to do? <laughs> Yellow robe at the airport? You'll look great. What do you want to do, huh? Pick a team. But that's not what he said. He says, that's your higher power. A God that loves you and with all his power, all he wants is for you to stay sober and like it. You know, it's all about me. And I did not believe for one minute that this would work. Not for one minute. But I was liking you folks. I enjoyed hanging out with you. You guys would go to I would go to coffee after the meetings and get ice creams and you invite me to meetings in your homes and I'm liking you guys. You know, I, I got nowhere else to go. Okay. I'm going to pray to this God and I'm going to do everything that's suggested. You all see me pray at the meetings. I'm documenting my meetings. I've got guys coming to my house. We're reading the big book out loud every day. Documenting who was there. Calling my sponsor, documenting the time. I got meetings, I got prayer, I got re I'm doing everything that's suggested because when I get drunk, I'm going to sue Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> that was my plan. That was my honest, sincere plan. There was no reason for me to do this stuff because there's no way I'm going to believe that it's going to work. But I'll do what you've suggested and document it, and I will sue you. And I will be a rich drunk. Because I figure you guys got lots of money. <laughs> anyway, I did what was suggested. And as a result of having done what was suggested, I didn't drink. 30, 60, 90, 120 days. Wow. And things started to happen to me. Things start to happen. You know, once I became willing to consider the idea that maybe there was a God, just maybe. And I became willing to look and see as opposed to just, you know, everything is a coincidence. Things started to happen. It was amazing. If you're new or nearly new, I just think you're in such a great place. It is so exciting to be 30, 60, 90 days sober. It is so exciting to be six months and nine months sober. I mean, the stuff that was happening to me then was just amazing. I mean, God would just, wow, he'd just manifest stuff. You'd just, wow, look at this auto. Whoa, check that out, buddy. There you go. What'd you think of that? Yeah, huh? You didn't even know that, did you? Wow. Yeah. And that's what was going on once I was willing to look. Now, you wonder, okay, these burning bushes or what? No, it's real simple stuff. But when you're willing to see, and, you know, God pleases an important prayer, but God thank you is more important. You know, when you take the little gifts that he gives us that turn out to be huge. It's like, you know, I swore I wouldn't be like my father. And I never hit my wife's and I never hit my kids. So I'm not like my dad. Yes, I am. I'm just like my dad. Why wouldn't I be? If we don't recover, we repeat. So I'm married and divorced and married and divorced. And I don't know how to get along. I just don't hit my wife. That's all. I don't hit my kids. I'm still an ass. And so... You know, I, uh, early in my sobriety, I thought, if I had a frisbee catching dog, the girls would all want me. <laughs> I could go to the park and throw that frisbee, and the girls would just go, eee! I'm a, I'm, I'm a little like Mark Tin. My motives are not always pure. <laughs> uh, me and Martin have a lot in common. We were talking in the car coming over. Anyway, so I'm trying to teach this little dog. It's a little spaniel. I'm trying to teach her how to catch a frisbee. And I don't throw very good, and she doesn't catch very good. If I'll throw it right in her mouth, you know, if I can get hit her in the mouth, she might get it. Otherwise, she's just fetching, <laughs> okay? I want her to catch, but she's just fetching. 
Anyway, in Oklahoma, it's windy, and I'm living in this little tiny inner city house. It's a little ranch house, but low roof. And the wind gets that frisbee one night, and it goes up on the roof of the house. And I, shoot, I don't have a ladder. Shoot, it's not a tall roof. I can't find a stick anywhere. So my best thinking, I get speeder. This is a little dog. It's not a high roof. I put her front paw on the roof, put my hand on her butt, and I pushed her up. Go get it, girl. Go get it. Well, she didn't go get it. She just got scared. And she peed all over. She just, she just showered pee down all over me. Oh, my God. And I put her down on the ground. I started to laugh at myself. I couldn't believe I was going to do something that stupid. Like she's going to run to the edge and jump off into my arms, you know, <laughs> to get her back. I don't think so. So I'm excited. I am excited. I called my sponsor, Johnny. Johnny, you will not believe what God just did. God, God made the dog pee on my head so I wouldn't put her on the roof. Otto, I don't know if God did that or not, but I believe he could, and I think you should go to a meeting and tell everybody. (laughs) I am off to a meeting. I am excited that God is working in my life, and they don't call on me, and it's burning desire time, burning desire time, and I'm sharing this story with them, and I hear myself say something I didn't know I was going to say. And I put the dog down on the ground and began to laugh at myself. And my old behavior would have been to kill the damn dog. Not a figure of speech. Not a figure of speech. That's the truth. I have battered my pets my whole life. I've had big, mean, go through the door to get you dogs. Kaiser and Heine and Rufus and Toots. And they will eat you because I treat them horribly. I batter my pets. I never hit my wife and I never hit my kids, but I hit my dogs. And what it is is I don't know how to feel. And so I stuff and 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 I stuff. And then something insignificant happens. The dog doesn't sit when I say sit and bam! Just the way my dad used to stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff. And then I'd say something and And that day God changed me because I'm willing to believe that I asked for his help and he is helping me just like he helps you. And I have not had to batter my pet since. And I began to understand my father. It was a long journey to forgive my father. My father was a nasty, vulgar, ugly man. But when I forgave my father, the joy for me was in the loving. I came to love my father just the way I love a newcomer in here, just the way you loved me when I was a newcomer for no reason other than the fact that you're loving people and you know the joy of loving someone who's suffering. And I loved my father, and when he died, I didn't bury a lovable one, but I certainly buried a loved one, somebody I'd known the joy of loving for years. (laughs) I've been sober about three years, and my first wife comes to me. She says, you're doing so good. You take the little bitch before I kill her. (laughs) And my teenage daughter comes to live with me. She is not happy to be there. She is a little bitch. (laughs) She comes by it honestly, you know. I'm her dad, you know. Man, you know, I told her, Holly, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to love you the way God loves us all. I'm going to love you the way we love each other in AA. She was not impressed. She said about to make my life a living hell. I'd pick her up from school and she would say things to me in the car and I want to reach over and pull the lips off of her face. <laughs> Man, I'd get her home. I, I'm doubling up on my Al-Anon meetings now. I'm here to tell you. I got sober in AA. I got happy at Al-Anon because I promise you, it's not working for me, okay? I needed some help with these relationships so I could calm these fingernails down, and I found it in al If you're not enjoying yourself in sobriety, come on over. Well, anyway, uh, 
I'd call my sponsor, Johnny, she's a pig. She's a pig. She won't clean her room. The room's full of dirty clothes, dirty dishes. Her room stinks. He says, Otto, she's not a pig. She's a little girl that's scared. She's totally out of control. She has no power. She doesn't know what's happening to her. She's somewhere she doesn't want to be. She's scared to death. Why don't you just love her? Try to make her feel safe. But her room, she's... He says, close the door if it bothers you. <laughs> Go by there and close the door. Hey! But you know what? After a while, she cleaned up the room when she got tired of it being dirty. When she wanted to have company over, she cleaned things up. You know what? And when I stopped playing judge and jury and executioner and knowing all the answers and demanding she be this and that and instead of trying to help her be what she wanted to be, which was a lot of things I didn't want her to be, but I helped her to be those things, then we begin to have a relationship. You know, when I start trying to love her unconditionally the way my God loves me, my God loves me because he's God, not because I'm good. I don't have to do anything to earn God's grace. God loves me because he is God. And I will love my daughter, and I have promised her, and I have done it. I love you because I am your loving father, no matter what. And our lives are wonderful. I'm a great grandpa today. I spent a whole fall building a treehouse for my granddaughter last fall. It was going to be about a $200 weekend job. <laughs> I should live in a house this nice, <laughs> you know. I mean, I know my granddaughter's going to be having sex in this treehouse pretty soon. You know, it's way over the top. But Anyway, Holly's been with me a while. We're really doing great. She turned 16. I bought her a little car. You know, it wasn't much of a car. She's not much of a driver. Uh, it's one of these cars that you press on the gas, and it just makes more noise. It doesn't go faster. You know, I figure she can't get hurt in that. And so... Uh, one night she comes to me, and I had this cool little convertible that I like to play in. It's got new paint, new top kicker stereo, you know. I'm one of these guys. You all have them at your clubs, at your groups. You know, the guy that parks the really cool car right in front of the door, even if it's illegal, you know. He puts the car right in front of the door so you can see what he's driving. You know. <laughs> you know, he's got, it, he's got it going on, you know. Anyway, Holly says, Dad, can, can Kristen and I take the convertible? She's been awful good. Mm, okay. Be careful. Put the top down. Psst, away they went. Just so happy. One 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Ring. Dad, I was going too fast and I crashed the car. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> Is Kristen okay? Where are you at? Where they're not supposed to be. Stay right there, sweetie. Stay right there. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. All bets are off. The little bitch is dead. <laughs> Anything but my car. Okay, this is over the top. Anything but my car. And I am furious. And I'm driving her little cracker box out to get her. And I am about to pull the steering wheel off of this car because it will not get me there fast enough. And I got this conversation going on in my head, you know, where she's going to say and then I'm going to say. And then when she says, I will say. And then she'll say and I'll say. You ever do that where you have a big fight and it's just you? You know, you ain't got there yet. Anyway, so I'm having this big fight with her. And I hear her say, I hear her say, Dad. I was going too fast, and I crashed the car. She did the unthinkable. She did the unheard of. She did a first in our family's entire lineage. She copped to it. She admitted she screwed up. Nobody admits to screwing up in my family. My father one time admitted a mistake. My mom had him sign a document. She had it framed and put on the wall. This is the truth. Nobody admits to anything. And she did that day. And I heard that. That's a gift from God in my mind that I could hear. I told my dad, Dad, a deer ran out in front of me and I swerved to miss it. 
which is not true. I was just going too fast and I crashed the family car. And my dad came, I remember he picked me up by my ear and he beat me. Don't you know what that car means to this family? Didn't I tell you to be careful? Don't you know what that's going to do to insurance? He beat me damn near to death. And that night I was able to go to Holly and comfort her. Because she knows what that car means to me. She knows that I told her to be careful. She knows what it's going to be and what it's going to do to insurance. I don't have to remind her. She's dying. She is absolutely dying. What a great time for dad to come whip your ass when you're just really hurting. You know, when the person you most wish to please in your life, you've just trashed. And that night I can go and do what's right, what's different, what's sober. And that's love my daughter. When I took my inventory, the only thing that was wrong that night was that I let her have the car. I promise you, my problems are of my own making, all of them. I want her to like me. I don't want to have to be a parent and make the tough decisions. My problems are of my own making. I learned that during my four step. Every problem I have in my life is of my own making. Even my disability. Now, how can that be? I was just an innocent soldier. No, not true. I was told if I could go 10 years without infection, I'd be a candidate for a prosthetic hip. I could not go a year without infection. I had pus running out of me all the time. It would close up for maybe a year, 18 months, and then it would come out again as some other piece of shrapnel or bone or something would come out of me. I had chronic osteomyelitis, a chronic staph infection. would not heal. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and 10 years in AA, I am 10 years of that infection. Go figure. Now, how does this happen? Do you think God reached down there and said, okay, Otto, you? No, I don't think so. Because I don't think my God doesn't make special rules for people. I think he treats us all the same. But what happened was, is when I couldn't take the pain pills to mask the pain, I stopped doing things that hurt me. I used to think I took the pills because I had the pain. Today I know I had the pain because of what I did when I took the pills. You know, I'd mow the yard, I'd play 36 holes of golf, I'd stay out and dance all night, and then I wonder why my hip hurts. I get sober, I stop doing that. I started parking in handicap parking. I started walking with a cane. I started taking care of myself. Something else I learned in Al-Anon, take care of yourself. <sighs> ten years sober, ten years no infection. Today I have a prosthetic hip. I live pain free. I, you saw me sitting in that chair just as you sit. I can sit on my toilet. I promise you sitting on the toilet is a big deal. Because for a long time, I could not sit on a toilet. This is how I sat for 28 years. If I wanted to use the restroom, it was pretty much a target shoot. And since they blew that part of my rear end off, you know, my sphincter is kind of winking at you, and you don't really know where things are going. And, you know, it, sometimes it depends on what... You know, if you're if you're at a, uh, out at a restaurant eating or something, they got these little tiny toilets. Then it's just you know, it's just bombs away. Come on, honey. You know? And uh, it's it's a miserable life. But today, today, ha ha, man, look at this. <laughs> Take that daily meditation, man. I can get you serious daily meditation done. <laughs> Next time you're in the crapper, I want you to think about me. <laughs> and how joyful what you're doing is. Because I mean, when you can't do it for 28 years, and you live with that chronic pain, it's awful. It was awful. I'm here to tell you, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that my God can't make right for me and hasn't. Today I'm happier, healthier, more whole physically, emotionally, socially, legally, financially, maritally, parentally than I've ever been in my life. I've been married 22 years to the same gal and we still like each other. Go figure. I'd rather be with her than anybody else. How does that happen in my family? I mean, there's a big sign next to my, you know, at the hospital says, no diving in this gene pool. <laughs> Please, <laughs> you know. 
this people get hurt over here. There's no diving. And yet, you know, uh, my kids are all doing great. Got three kids, they're all doing great. None of them are doing what I want them to do. <laughs> they're all doing great. And I'm, you know what? I have relationships with all of them because I haven't said a damn thing about what they're doing. Except I love you. <laughs> Way to go. You know what? My brother's a pedophile. He's had a stroke. He can't talk. He still uses. He still deals. But I send him nice letters and I send him nice cards and I visit him when I'm in Oklahoma City because I'm his loving brother. Not because of anything he has or has not done. And I get gifts for being that person. I sat down to write him a Christmas card one time. I have no recollections of my childhood except the pictures of my childhood and the horrors of my childhood. Pictures from the scrapbook. Yeah, I remember that dog. I, I seen pictures of it. I remember nothing in my childhood except the horror. And I start to write him a card for his birthday. And I always try to think of something nice to write for this despicable person. And I hope he never hears one of my talks. I don't know why he would. I just started to write, Carl, do you remember when? And out of that pencil flowed all the fun we had as kids playing Annie over the house, chasing popsicle, popsicle sticks down the, the street gutter when it rained, and racing those sticks and building forts. And I mean, it just rolled out. I wrote page after page after page, and I sent that to him in a birthday card. And he ran to show it to my mother, my mother who'd never known a moment of kindness in her life, who'd only known abuse. It was the first time anyone had ever recognized her successes as a parent. And she took that and had it framed for all her kids. And I got my childhood back. And my mom and I begin to embrace. I come to find out no one ever touched my mother with anything but a, a mean hand. And God had me embrace my mother one day. And she became like a puppy. I mean, she just couldn't get enough of it. It was just, oh, come on, baby, come on. Oh. All of my relations have changed. Everything's changed. And the only thing that changed was me. The only thing that was had to change was me. The only thing that had to be willing to change was me. I came into recovery. I stopped drinking. I did what was suggestion. I have had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, not a result, one of many. It is the desired result of taking the steps. You want to get sober? Quit drinking. You are sober. You want to have a spiritual awakening? Take the steps. It'll change your life. You can enter into a new and better relationship with the God of your understanding. And he might do for you as he's done for so many of us. And that's those things that we can't do for ourselves. I'm out of time. Sorry I can't tell you some other really cool stuff. <laughs> but God is good. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.